I decided to start with a joke today. Um, part of it, if you watch the evening devotions uh, uh, that I do on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and this last week the, the topic was uh, joy versus somber Christians, and sometimes we get ourselves so serious. But also, you know, when you used to, when I first started, uh, so let's see, I've been pastoral ministry. Uh, I preached my first sermon uh, at the first church I was on staff at 1997. So I've been doing this for a little while. And that used to be how, how all pastors started a sermon. You remember that? They'd all start with a bad joke, right? We'd all start with a bad joke, and then we'd get into the message. And so uh, this morning, I was, uh, I was in a, a Facebook group with a bunch of pastors, and somebody threw this out there. And I thought, well, what a perfect bad joke. Let's start with that, and then uh, we'll just we'll get into the message today. All right, so, hey, do you know why chickens aren't allowed in church? Because they use foul language. Uh, now, remember, in comedy, a laugh, a groan is as good as a laugh, so that's all right. That's all right. So, hey, this morning we're going to continue on in the book of Acts. And so if you want to open up to Acts chapter 19, that's where we're going to be in the book of Acts today. Um, the topic today is what's in a name? What's in the name? How many of you know what your name means? The, the definition of your name. My name, Spencer, is the, the, uh, the keeper of the Lord's provision, is what it, what it means. Um, Bennett's name, now we got a, a cool picture of Bennett here. Um, Bennett's name, this is one of my favorite pictures of him. Um, here's the story. So, you know, as, you know, we, we, you know Bennett's adopted, right? We, we adopted him. Uh, for, it was a great blessing. But when they called us about his adoption, uh, they called us on a, a, on a Monday, they said, well, are you interested? We're like, yes, we're interested. They called us on Tuesday. They go, not to rush you, but we need a name. Uh, and so uh, the, the heating and air conditioning company for our church in Virginia is named, was named Bennett. <laughs> and we liked the name, and then we looked it up, and it means blessed. And we're like, well, what a great name. What a great name, blessed. And so this, this picture was actually taken our last day in Virginia, uh, just, uh, uh, they, they just happened to be there working. And so as I picked up Bennett from, from the preschool there, I said, hey, stand. so he's literally standing on the bumper of, this, of the truck so we could get a picture uh, of, of, his, um, of, of him in front of his namesake, um, Bennett Heating and Air. And so um, it's a great story. It's a fun story. Um, but it's true. And so, but bless, what, what, now how would, who, who wouldn't want to be blessed, right? That's a great name. Um, names mean things, don't they? Names mean things. Uh, Ursula Le Guin, uh, she's a real famous science fiction writer. Uh, she had a series called the, 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 it's World of Earth and Sea is what she talks about. They talk about names having power. And, and the, the, the whole, all of her characters within, within this world, they never reveal their true name because if you give their true name, uh, then somebody would have power over them. How about this? When you go to the doctor and you've got a pain in your side, there are certain names that you hear that you're afraid of, right? right? Certain, but, but here's the thing. Until your doctor names what your pain is, they don't know how to treat it. They don't know what to do with it. And so actually by having the name of something, you have a sense of authority over it. A sense of, uh, it makes it less scary, doesn't it, right? Maybe if we, as children, if we just named all the monsters under our bed Clyde, it would be a whole lot less scary because who's afraid of Clyde? Nobody's afraid of Clyde. But the nameless monster under our bed, how many, be, be honest with me, as adults, we can all be adults in this room, how many of you still, if your arm's hanging over the side of the bed, you pull it back in, right? Because subconsciously in your head, Clyde is going to climb out and pull it under, isn't it? Right? Right. I don't, I don't let my arm hang off the bed. It's worse. It's scary. Scared. I don't know. I don't know the guy that lives underneath there. So this portion of scripture that we're looking at today, uh, it records kind of the final steps of the gospel beginning to be proclaimed to the Gentiles, and really specifically, it's the formation of of, of the Gentile church in the city of Antioch in Syria. So even modern Syria, this is where we're, we're talking about. So apparently, here's, here's where it was. There are so many Christians, so many, so many people in Antioch came to Christ that the local population 
came up with a new, follow, new, new term for those that followed Jesus. Do you know what that term was? Christian. Acts 11.26, it tells us this. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now this, um, <coughs> this nickname, it probably came from the Gentile townspeople because the Jewish uh, believers wouldn't have picked to Christ as a form of their name. Um, but they, they probably described it as little Christ, as, as little followers, because they, up till this time, they've been talked about as, as the disciples or the saints. There was even a period of time where they were referenced as the way. They followed the way. Um, but they, they picked the name Christian, little Christ, in the town of Antioch. The people of Antioch, here's, here's what it was. There were so many people that were following Jesus, they finally said in Antioch, all right, well, there's just so many of you. We got to give you some kind of name so we know how to tell other people what's going on or who you are. And so the the people of Antioch, they they came up with a label for the the new vessel, uh, which this this new group of people that were, were coming around. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the timeline in the book of Acts, we're actually about 15 years after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and the day of Pentecost. So this is about 15 years. So for 15 years, just you just had a group of believers that followed Jesus that weren't really called anything, you know, the way or the saints or the disciples. You had a couple of apostles thrown in there probably. But they didn't have a group name. They didn't have a group name. But here in Antioch, all of a sudden they said, hey, we're going to call you Christians. That's what we're going to call you. You know, we live in a time here in the United States and in around the world where Christian has become one of the vaguest words on the planet. During the British colonial uh, era, the, the word Christian became synonymous with Englishmen in India. It didn't make any difference how godly or perverted the man was. It, it was the word that was used to describe an Englishman. In our own century... Christian nations have engaged in multiple wars with other countries. Some people think that everyone who is not Jewish or Muslim is a Christian. Dr. Henry Ironside, uh, he once handed a gospel booklet to a man on a train, and the man turned to him and replied, "What, what did you give me that book for? Dr. Ironside replied, I thought you might be interested. And may I ask, are you a Christian? Well, he replied indignantly, Take a good look at me. Do I look like a Jew? You look like an American. Then he responded, you have your answer. See, there's so many people that say, uh, are willing to say Christian as a cultural reference, but not necessarily willing to say, I am a Christian. They are cultural Christians who, who have not experienced the saving commitment of Jesus Christ. They would think that they're in a Christian nation, although I think most of us now in the church today would, would arguably look at our, our country and say, we have a hard time calling the United States a Christian nation. Maybe we're in transition there. Some would call us a post-Christian culture. Antioch was, was situated on uh, the Ortez River, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem, and 20 miles east of the Mediterranean. Uh, and they, they were at the convergence of, of Taurus and Lebanon mountains, where the river runs through on its way to the sea. And during the first century, it was the third largest city in the world. Think about it. Third largest city in the world. And there were so many people that followed Jesus in the third largest city in the world that they had to come up with a name to identify who they were. Antioch was was famous. Uh, It was famous for its worship of Daphne, whose uh, whose temple stood about five miles outside the city. This is actually the remnants of of the the temple of Daphne. Um, Apollo's famous pursuit uh, of Daphne was reacted, uh, re- reenacted day and night by the men of the city and the priestess, uh, who in actuality, actuality, the priestess of Daphne's temple, they were, they were temple prostitutes. Throughout the world, the morals of Daphne was a euphemism for depravity. The, the, the Romans aimed 
uh, his sharpest barbs at, the, at Rome when he said to Antares, has flowed into the Tiber, flooding the city with wickedness. Antioch and Daphne were associated with perversion. They were associated with depravity, prostitutes. That's what they were known for. And amazingly enough, in this city, with all of its sensuality and immorality, this was the place that the disciples were called Christians first. Antioch was also the birthplace of foreign missions. We'll see that in Acts chapter 13. Had the greatest preachers come through it. It was the first century Barnabas, Paul, Peter, that came through there and, and preached. Why were they called Christians in Antioch is a, is a good question. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 20, here's what it says. It says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled through uh, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about Jesus. See, persecution, it thrusts two kinds of believers into parts of the world. You see them, they disperse into different parts of the world. And the first, they share the good news only with Jews. Now, we've talked about Peter and his vision and how it expanded to recognize that the Gentiles were to be preached to as well. And we know that Paul, his Damascus Road experience, was for the purpose because Paul was called to be Jesus' instrument to the Jew, or to the Gentiles. The second group was willing to share the gospel with both Jew and Gentile because they were what was called Hellenized Jews. That means they spoke Greek. And they were not so attached to the Jewish principles. Merely verbalizing and, and, and sharing the witness of Jesus in their heart, they were able to um, impact those that previously would have been left alone. And they weren't aware, because they didn't get so steeped in old traditions, they weren't aware that they would have been violating anybody's tradition by talking to people that weren't Jewish as well. See, here's, here's the thing that I find so fascinating about Antioch and so encouraging about Antioch. And it goes to a little bit of what I shared at the offering talk. Antioch <clears throat> was not evangelized they didn't hear about Jesus by the apostles coming. They didn't hear about Jesus by the disciples coming. They didn't hear about Jesus because of some massive organized campaign to reach the third largest city in the world. They heard about Jesus from a group of people that were transformed by Jesus. Everyday, regular people talking about Jesus in their everyday lives. Sharing Jesus was to them as natural as breathing or smiling or laughing. Everyday believers empowered by the Holy Spirit of God blew away the hold of paganism and met the needs of people. What an amazing example for us today. The result was a great harvest in Antioch. Acts 11.21 says this, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. No apostles, no deacons, no ecclesiastical stru structure, just the hand of of the Lord and a tremendous number of new believers. Now listen, obviously I'm, I'm called to be a pastor. God's called me to be a shepherd. But I think we can look at our world today and we can look at our country today, we can look at the community around us and say it's not following Jesus. We can see it. And sometimes as believers, we can get overwhelmed and discouraged and scared and worried and, and wonder, what are we going to do? Years ago, I heard a, 
uh, he was actually a youth leader. His name was Mike Iaconelli. He, he talked about how oftentimes the church is seen like as, a, as a castle, that we, we let down the drawbridge for Sunday mornings and then we, we, we wheel it back up in the, during the week so that we can protect those within. But that's not what the church is. The church isn't called to be a castle. It's a place of healing. It's a place of restoration. But here's the thing. I'm not the only surgeon. I'm not the only doctor. We're all called. Acts chapter 4, not Acts chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 tells you specifically, actually, my job is to prepare the body for works of service. You are the body. What made Antioch so effective and and so influential and so great was not the pastor, it was the body. And here as a church, I will will stand in front of you and attest to this, because this is a thing I really don't like seeing. I do not like seeing churches that have made all of their promotional material about the pastor. Because I've seen it, right? Where they, they slap the pastor's face, and I'm good looking, I understand, uh, but they slap the pastor's face on every postcard. Come join Pastor so and so, and and blah blah, and it comes. Listen, I, I, if you come to hear me preach, I want you to come to hear me preach because I preach about Jesus, not because of my winning smile and stunning personality. You don't have to laugh so quickly at that. The reality is the church is 100% about honoring Jesus. And the ministry of the church is 100% dependent upon you as the body of believers responding to the call of Jesus. Antioch was so effective because They didn't wait for the pastor to say, all right, go tell people about Jesus now. They just told people about Jesus. And I wonder, in the world that we live in today, in the culture that we live in today, when our, not just our church, but the capital C church, is going to rise up and wake up and shake up this world. We can lament and cry and worry about the direction of our country, or we can tell people about Jesus and let the Holy Spirit transform their lives. Listen, the Christians that went into Antioch, well, actually, the believers that went into Antioch, they weren't Christians yet because they didn't have that name. When they went into Antioch and started telling people about Jesus, they knew they were going into the den of the lion. They were going into the belly of the beast. They were going into a place that literally, the place that the, the city was known for worshiping had temple prostitutes that you were encouraged to visit. Is there anything more depraved than that? We live in a society that honors the same things, don't we? And so we can sometimes feel persecuted because people don't like us. But listen, they didn't like the early Christians either. It didn't stop them. It didn't stop them. See, a similar thing happened to George Fox and his followers in 1640 as he stood before a certain justice and uh, bid him to tremble at the word of the Lord. That's what George Fox did. In response, the, the judge standing in front of Fox, he called him and his followers Quakers. Elton Trueblood commented this. He said, one of the best evidence that the image which Fox and his associated conveyed to their contemporaries was a dynamic one, is that it provided them the nickname Quakers. The same thing can be said for the Methodists. The Methodists who were so, they were named because of their systematic, methodical pursuit of holiness. So if a spiritual dynamic operated among us causing people to reach a new word to describe us, what would that word be today? Would it be Pentecostal, spirit-filled, weirdo, kook? What 
word or what words do they use now to describe us? When God's people live for Jesus in such depth and power that those around them have to strive for a new term to describe what they see, that is awesome. I want people to look at people, I want, to, I want people to look at others from this church and go, dude, what is going on with you? I want the world to see the difference in our lives that is so evident that people around say, there's something different about you. I'm not sure that I want to do that, but could you at least tell me what's going on? When you forgive unforgivable things, when you show compassion to those that are unlovable, when you reach out and you show grace and mercy and you reflect Jesus to those around you, and people go, there's something different about you. They might have to come up with a new word for you. They might have to come up with a new word for you. Hopefully it's a kind word. But if it's not, that's okay. Remember, the early church, they, they rejoiced when they were persecuted. Before long, things were so powerful in Antioch that the church in Jerusalem's like, hey, we got to check out what's going on here. You know, we, we, we got to see what's happening. And so they sent Barnabas. And Barnabas went down. And Barnabas, when he got there, what he saw, uh, actually, when you see verse 23 says, when he arrived, he saw the evidence of grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas saw the grace of God when he went there, and he could have easily seen a situation in a different light. He could have easily said, whoa, 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 guys, hang on, you're not doing it like we do it in Jerusalem, so let's pull it on back now. But he saw God's grace, and he embraced it. Here are these groups of people, new, untrained, untaught, uneducated, unprepared Christians just telling people about Jesus. And it was effective. It was effective. Sometimes we feel like we don't know enough about Jesus to tell other people about Jesus. Listen, you might not be able to answer everybody's questions about Jesus, but do you know Jesus? Yes. Has he done something in your life? Yes. You know enough to tell other people about him? Because you can tell him what he did for you. Tell people what Jesus did in your life. Why are you a Christian? It's not just so you can come here once a week and sit in a comfortable chair. The pews aren't that comfortable. They're okay. You're a Christian because Jesus has changed your life. All you got to do is tell people what Jesus did in you. And if it's been so long since you felt Jesus do something in you, then get down here to the altar and let them do something new. Come to the Pentecost rally next Sunday. Get refreshed. Go home and lay down on your face and worship God and let him transform you. Because what God has done in you before, he will do it again if you give him the space to do it. That's why I am not afraid of the current season that we're in. I was talking to some folks the other day, and they just kept on saying, I'm worried about the church. I'm worried about the church. I'm worried about the church. I'm not worried about the church because this is God's church. This is Jesus's bride. Who is going to build the church? Jesus will build the church. Does it look different than it did before? Yes, it does. But has God been faithful? 100%. And how's he going to build the church? With you and I. You and me, we get to do it. Praise Jesus. Let's go tell people about Jesus. I'm excited today. This is not in my notes. That's okay. Listen. Listen. Has Jesus changed your life? Tell somebody about it. You remember what we said last week? That the, the, if, if we don't get a little aggressive with telling people about Jesus, then they're never going to make a choice to follow him. 
Man, just sit at your desk at work and put on that, that song, I Speak Jesus, and just sing it all day. I don't care if you sing good or not. And people are going to go, all right, okay, okay. If you tell me about Jesus, will you stop singing at least? Annoy them into the kingdom of heaven. It's okay. Here's the thing. The people of Antioch, the Christians of Antioch, cared so little about their reputation and status in the community that they went to people that they knew would find them offensive, that they knew would reject the message. And they told them about Jesus. And they lived like they believed it. The church was a holy but disconcerting presence in the dark city of Antioch. The church became even more vital and to the pagan mind, even more perplexing as the goodness and fullness of the Holy Spirit and the faith seen in Barnabas began to reproduce in that young church. Acts 11.24 says, And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. <clears throat> Listen, there were so many people coming to Jesus that Barnabas, who was, he, he, he knew, he was not a new convert. He knew he couldn't do it on his own. So what did he do? He wrote back to Jerusalem, I need help. I need help. Who is Bar Barnabas' name normally associated with in the Bible? Paul. That's who Jerusalem sent. See, remember, we saw Paul got saved. Paul, in the Damascus Road experience, but then he got transformed. Paul was no longer a neophyte. Paul was no longer a new convert. He had had years of years of training. And he came. And his theology, his theology had crystallized and matured. He was full of Christ. Galatians 2.20, here's what Paul wrote. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave me, gave himself for me. Paul and, and Saul and Barnabas, it went from, Saul, it went from Barnabas and Saul to the missionary journeys, you see Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas could have been the big dog in that city, right? But he shows us an example, says it's not about me, it's about people coming to know Jesus. Send somebody to help. And he took a secondary role to Paul on purpose. When Paul and Barnabas ministered in Antioch, they were a dynamic duo. But the effectiveness of the ministry in Antioch came from a few things. Because it was already effective before the disciples showed up, wasn't it? It came from the believers in the city owning that ministry. Telling other people about Jesus and being led by the Holy Spirit. Remember when Paul became a follower of Jesus? He didn't immediately go to Jerusalem. What did he do? He went three years being instructed just by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think we're not enough. And by yourself, you are correct. You are not enough on your own. You might be a brilliant communicator and a wonderfully compassionate person, but on your own, you, not, you are not enough. You need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and a willingness to serve in order to be genuinely effective in telling other people about Jesus. And that's why the city of Antioch was changed is because the believers there were so young in their faith that they were foolish enough to believe all they needed to do was tell people about Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to use them. But sometimes we get so mature in our faith and we get so jaded where we tell people, we tell people, we tell people, and we get to the point where we say, listen, I could tell them, but it's not going to do anything for them. Let's have the faith like a child that says, if I tell you about Jesus, you're going to believe in him. I, I love Friday night we had the Gunters over to our house. We had the Gunters over to our house and um, Judah, the, the, the youngest, he's eight. Comes, he's not the youngest, Ezra's the youngest. Comes running in, Judah comes running in and goes, Bennett said you got a dog. And, and we don't have a dog. And uh, so, so Judah goes running over to Bennett. You said you have a dog? And Bennett goes, 
We do. He's imaginary. Without skipping a beat, Judah goes, cool, where is he? That's the faith of a child. That if we tell people about Jesus, we believe that they're going to hear about Jesus. The cosmopolitan, depraved city of Antioch could not fit this new group of people into any category. So they had to come up with a new name. Perhaps they were, they were jesting or mocking with this nickname, or maybe they were even a little mad at him. Because these people were such a contradiction to the nature of Antioch. The new term was, was kind of a mongrel name. It was a mixture of, of Greek and, and kind of and some Latin. But it's, it, it, it said it all. Christians, followers of Christ. Christ was so much on the lips of the believers and in the lives of these people, they lived so much like Christ that no other name would fit them. Christian is a wonderful name. It's a name which we should all seek to be worthy of. Alexander the Great once learned uh, that his army was that, of, of somebody in his army that had his name. It's so of another Alexander. And this young man, unfortunately, was a coward. So Alexander the Great, who had conquered the world when he was just 23, called the soldier before him and said, Is your name Alexander? Yes, the soldier replied. And were you named for me? Yes, I was named for you. Alexander the Great said, Then you either need to be brave or change your name. Fortunately for us, Jesus doesn't make that same expectation of us as Christians. But he does call us to live faithful and obedient in our service. I really truly believe we have to recapture the spirit of Antioch. If we're going to be called Christians, we have to recapture that same exuberance and passion to share the gospel that the early church had. We need to be able to say with our lives and our words, this is Jesus. See, being a Christian is not about coming to church, although that's part of it. Being a Christian is not about tithing, although that's part of it. Being a Christian is not about serving others, although that's part of it. Being a Christian is not about worship, reading your Bible, or praying, although that's part of it. Being a Christian is about living 100% dedicated to Jesus. Being a Christian means Jesus is the center of everything. All of our decisions, all of our choices, our focus, our energy, our time, our effort, it all starts with Jesus. It's not where can we fit church in. It's not where can we fit Jesus in. It's where does everything else fit in around Jesus. A life dedicated to Jesus will bear fruit that can only come from Jesus. And here's my question for you today. And this is one that only you can answer. If everyone around you lived their life like you do, with the same level of commitment to Jesus as you do, would they move closer or further away to Jesus? If the answer is that they would move further away from Jesus, then, what ne then the question you have to answer for yourself is, what needs to be removed, changed, or repositioned in your life to allow Jesus to be the center. Let's recapture the spirit of Antioch. Let's be so on fire and in love with Jesus that He just oozes from everywhere. And it's all people see when they see us. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning I pray You fill us. <clears throat> fill us to overflowing Father, give us that passion. Jesus, fill us with that passion of the people of Antioch, the believers of Antioch that were called Christians for the first time. And let us be worthy of that namesake. 
Jesus, fill us with passion. Fill us with your grace and mercy. Call us by your name. Transform this world using us to do it. Bless us today. In your precious name we pray. Amen.